Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so, Cynthia, like a technical kind of question, like again, sorry to take you back there. So, when you started like all this, uh, you could, you, I mean, you made the constitutive materials and all that stuff too, right? You might have made some of the constitutive. So, what goes into that? Can you just tell? I, I'm always curious to know, like, if you want to create a new material, how do you do that? A new open seas material? And, and how do you integrate into the main thing? If you're, for example, you have concrete 02, 01, 04, and maybe I want to make one more. And how do you integrate? I mean, just curious, how do you make it? I honestly have made it a point to not get my hands into the open seas code. I haven't done it. I don't, I haven't, uh, uh, Christian will tell you. Christian knows the answer. I have stayed high level. One is, I just don't want to learn C++. I really don't. I tried. I don't oh. have, my ADHD brain cannot deal with the semantics of forgetting this or that. So the way I do it is, and it's simple, and this is my recommendation to you, is one is there are online resources. Some people have put in videos. There's some good videos on YouTube and this and that. And then get in touch with Michael Scott. And it's literally a two hour session with Michael. It's not that hard to put a material. Element is different. Um, but it's, it's going to take you days to figure, like Christian said, it, it took forever to figure this out on his own. Uh, but we're trying to build resources where we can make out a knot line where you can do it. Um, so if you want to add a material, you got to get in touch with Christian okay. or um, with Michael. I really don't know the answer to that one. I mean, maybe that's, that's my answer. Or, maybe Christian or Michael, Dr. Michael can give a presentation on that. That would be good. <laughs> yeah. We could. I did, uh, I implemented two elements so far. Oh, that's but I'm awesome. not sure like, how, how, how well are they working or not. No, just the process of knowing end to end is important, like because like you always come up. I mean, it's just for the material. There is a good example from um, from McKenna, Dr. McKenna on YouTube. So it's just simple. For the material, there is an implementation, uh, step by step approach from Dr. McKenna. You okay. can find it on YouTube. It's, he does a linear, I think, elastic material. Very, very simple. Okay. The, the hard with those, I believe, is the compiling the code and getting OpenSeas up and running in the code and being able to compile it. And then you pretty much, as Christian said, you follow uh, Frank's instructions and you never start from scratch. You take from an existing one. That's why it's concrete O2. There's no like concrete something else. I mean, they're all just variations and it's very frustrating, I have to say, um, variations of an, an existing script. So sometimes it's just a couple of lines. And so the hard thing, it seems to me when I took the course is the compilation and getting things up there and running. So what courses and type of courses is an interesting thing, I think. I mean, a lot of people has that because everyone is working in different areas, like for example, some are infrastructure interaction, steel, concrete, and even within concrete, you have walls, columns, and all this stuff. So like, I mean, it's hard to make a generic course, right, for all of these. Well, I'm currently working on a couple of different courses. I'm working on something on SSI, I'm working on something on probabilistic seismic hazard analysis as well, because I think it's important as yeah. much as it's not. And I'm trying to go beyond uh, just open seas. I think there, there's a lot of things. I, I see so many people selecting ground motions. I feel like there's just a lot of gaps there so that yeah. you as a open, open seas user, actually, you know, you're not just living in the open seas bubble. So I'm a, teaching structural dynamics right now at UCLA. And so I'm, I'm taking notes on that course so that I could build a, a course on structural dynamics, even though there's some guy on YouTube that has done an amazing job, so. And yeah, I mean, you can, do you have any suggestions for us? Like how to, I mean, what 
direction we should take and like how it can be more useful like what kind of stuff we need to work on so my recommendation to students is what i learned when i left so i left um, open seas and went to work at dig and kolb engineers uh, and the work that I'm doing right now with the guys at homes is in academia, we think that we are doing the difficult problems and in engine, in the profession, it's all, everything is simplified, but it's actually the opposite. They are doing amazingly interesting projects, much more interesting than what we're doing in academia. And they're more challenged and they have to come up with an answer. Um, and so I, I think is as a student, do an internship, go see what, you know, and you guys in New Zealand, I mean, the homes folks are as sophisticated in analysis as it gets. Um, and, uh, but do an internship, find out what the real problems are and interact with people, learn and also learn a lot about the US building code because uh, that's what I'm working on right now. It's like in the US and European building codes and things, it's one thing to build a model, but it's another to do it according to what the building code tells you to do. And the building code is the law and you have to meet the criteria. And so really understanding whatever models you're developing and whatever, you know, whether it's an element or it's you're looking at a, at a structure, look at how people in industry are doing these problems. Their academic problems are a lot more interesting than what we are doing in academics. Uh, it, it's interesting, I always thought it was the opposite, uh, but there's some really clever stuff that they're doing out in industry, especially because they gotta make do with what they have. <laughs> um, and sometimes, you know, all these concrete models, that's my other recommendation is, there's so many different concrete models with so many parameters, but when you're looking at a building, you wanna have the least number of input parameters. So maybe don't use concrete 01, maybe go to concrete 02, but stop there. You know, if you want convergence, <laughs> yeah. then use concrete 02, or if not concrete 01, and that's gonna get, so I have this battle because I love the fact that the IMK materials, the modified Ibarra Krebinkler models, I love their degrading, but they're not as robust because the problem with a lot of these materials is they're written by a PhD student, brilliantly so, but then they had to finish and then they got a job. And so there's not enough iteration in these. And the IMK models have been through a few iterations, so they're good. Uh, but, you know, so many times it's like, oh, I can't get my model to converge. I'm like, well, go to hysteretic and then you won't have it. I tested it. It doesn't have convergence problems. Um, so don't get so caught up in the 17 little parameters of pinching four. That was developed for a very specific case of a cantilever column. And that's wonderful if you're trying to capture all the little steps. Uh, or actually it was a joint or whatever it is. But my point of it is when you're looking at a building structure, make your model as simple as possible and use the least expensive um, materials. And uh, fiber sections, only use fiber. This is my technical recommendation is yeah. use the least number of fiber sections and only use fiber sections in elements, not only where you want PM interaction because you can model PM interaction with a uniaxial section, because you perform your analysis under that uh, axial force, only if your axial force varies enough in your element during the analysis, do you need PM interaction, okay? And be careful to use, do not use fiber sections in your beams because that's super expensive. Uh, also, as your beam is yielding, be careful on how you're handling your constraints because you may be putting in some axial forces into your fiber section that wants to elongate. But if you're putting in a rigid diaphragm, you're not letting it elongate. So you're putting in this additional axial forces into your beam that makes it stronger. And so you think you're doing a better model, but you're actually doing a worse model because it's not realistic. Um, so those are my little experience, it's the question that I answer 
every time, you know, most likely it's that those are the technical hints that I can give you in building a model. Um, and then you will have your convergence problems are not going to be there so much anymore. I can't guarantee they won't be there, but it, it definitely improves your model. So, so the other thing I was uh, interested in knowing is like we have the fiber section as the most complex uh, section element we have, right? So is there something like, are we going, so I was like looking for bond slip and stuff. So like how we are modeling the interface between the bar and uh, concrete and all that stuff. So like, uh, I mean, is there like how to do those things and all that stuff? Yeah, you can do that by going to a continuum type of model, right? Where you oh, can, three, okay, 3D model, something. Yeah, you know, solids. And, and so, and, and then, so that's the other thing to do is, and I know a lot of people do this with Abacus, but you can do it with open seas is model that, do a little study of that connection, but then don't put it into your building. Then develop what we call a phenomenological model that captures all that. So this is a problem with, and it's a struggle that I'm having because fiber sections are great because they model PM interaction but they don't capture everything else that's going on. It doesn't capture the bolt slip. It doesn't, you know, and so what people are doing with just simple, you know, uniaxial hinges is they're calibrated to the test. They're calibrated to reality and they actually capture better. So a fiber section is not always your best section because you may be missing out other mechanisms. If you don't model your mechanism in your finite element model, you're not going to be able to model it, right? Yeah. Um, so oftentimes just phenomenological models are better, are more robust um, and more accurate than a fiber section. A fiber section is not, no matter how much you want to get into bond slip. And I did testing on these bean column joints and what was happening is my yield was penetrating all the way to the other side of the column. And so my bars that should have been in tension from bending from one side, it was actually just, I wasn't, I didn't have enough depth to anchor my rebar uh, through the joint. How do we do this with plain sections remain plain? You can't do that. You have to go to a continuum model or you do experimental tests, you do studies and you figure out how that works. And then you don't model it explicitly, you model it implicitly through a phenomenological type of model that takes all that into account. So if you wanna put in bond slip, do a little study of your section and then don't go crazy with fiber sections and as this and that, maybe it can work for a cantilever or for just a single joint. But if you wanna put it into your building, then do that as a substructure, quote unquote, do your study, develop a hinge that represents what's going on there and then put that hinge into your building. I wanted to do it for a soil structure interaction. So. Oh, awesome. I'd love to talk I mean, to you about that and, and see. Yeah, that's why I'm trying to find ways. For a cantilever column, it's like zero section at the base and then you spin score and you can capture it. But like for the soil structure interaction, should I use in the zone where it is having the peak stresses, use at each element, like I'm using displacement based elements. So like, at each end of element, should I use a zero length section or whatever? It's getting complex, but that's why I was like, is there any easier way? Because sometimes you go too complex, but there is an easy solution. But then do that little region, do a detailed analysis of that region to validate your springs, your cross section there. Because the goal is to really look at soil structure interaction where it's just really a flexibility. I don't care where that flexibility comes in from whether it's from bar slip or yield penetration or something else, um, which are different mechanisms, you do a substructure, come up with a hinge, and then you put that into your overall model because it's just another flexibility component. Yeah, yeah. I'm Roy, I come from China. And, hi. Uh, uh, hi. And uh, uh, as you refer to, uh, refer to the modi uh, modified iron cable though, material, and uh, also um, building a job, uh, building a model with that material. Uh, I, I, I wonder if you could uh, provide more detailed uh, recommendation for that material. 
And I noticed about uh, something that the uh, modified IMK material has uh, several editions in the, in the GitHub, and uh, the modified IMK in the OCS website uh, seems just the old edition. And when I deal with that material, I found uh, it seems to have some uh, convergence problem after uh, when I'm running the model. So could you give me some advice? Because uh, I found that uh, those several editions of the modified IMK have different uh, arguments. They, they are changed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm confused. Which one is the best? It's, a, it's an interesting one. Okay. So I was talking to Frank about this the other day, actually. Okay. He said, because then at some point I was, I was trying to narrow that down and I had to, I got in touch. So it's like the modified, modified, modified IMK, right? So, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, Dimitrios Lignius, who is now in Switzerland, he's kind of like the gatekeeper, I think, of those. The executable and I may be wrong, and that's my understanding, is the executable in OpenSeas does have the latest version, but they keep the code in their own repository just so that they manage it in this. But the version, I, there was something, wait a minute, how does this parameter go? But honestly, what I learned about those materials is the only one that you care about is the deterioration. You should buy my software because I play with it. Let me see if I can, am I, I'm sharing, right? So... Yeah, yeah. Um, it, 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 I love that material. Where's open seas? Um, okay. If you don't care about degradation, just use hysteretic. Um, but let's say it, I've got, I don't know, material. So you see, there's like a bunch of, and then there's three of them, but I like the pinching one, okay? <laughs> So here's the pinching material. And what I've done is I've broken down, as I was telling you in easy between the requirement properties and, oh, I'm, I'm in a really poor resolution screen. Yeah. So I'm sorry that this is as small as it gets. Okay. Um, so these are my default parameters on there, which all I care about is certain, I pretty much just use these values to define the envelope. And then everything else I kind of played around with until it gave me this. And so with easies, I'm actually able to like play with these numbers to see. So it gives me what I want. The only one I care about, I've learned, is this deterioration parameter. This one, you changes just a tiny little bit. And it's really cool. I mean, it's really neat what it can do. So I'm going to copy. This is without deterioration, right? So now I'm going to test it with deterioration. Ah, oh, look at that. Isn't that cool? And so if I paste the previous values, just changing it to 0 0.042, look at how much did you, it may be even given me too much. And that's why I like my program. That's the point of it. It's like, uh oh, maybe I need, and I have a test data that I'm trying to, you know, and you can copy this data and bring it over to Excel to compare it to, but maybe you just need very little uh, deterioration and see. So, I, there's a million parameters on here that I don't know and I don't understand. And I just kind of play with them and I've kind of given up on them because I've figured out enough just to do this envelope. But then you, you want to build like yourself a tiny little material tester. It does, you don't have to go fancy like this, but build yourself a little material tester that allows you to change these values and figure it out. And when you do, let me know. Now, Christian is going to give you the link in the chat for a, a tool that they developed in Salerno, because these Italians are awesome. Yes, I'm Italian. Where you can put in your test data and uh, they give you the parameters that you need for certain open seas materials. I don't know if you guys have seen this little app that they have, it's handy. Uh, the other one is, I know Dimitris Lignos has done a lot of documentation on his own stuff on these materials and you just kind of got to play with it. So yeah, this multical.unisa.it and uh, I don't want to open it up right now, because it, but it's really cool, and uh, it's got information on that. So we can share that link. We can put this link in the YouTube uh, video. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that's a great place to start. But yeah, to me, these materials are a mystery. Go to Hysteretic. I love Hysteretic. I mean, look at what you could do with a Hysteretic. I mean, anything you can do there, you can do better with Hysteretic except for the degrading, but I'm working on that. Here's hysteretic and it 
it's a wonderful material, I think. It can do what IMK can do. Uh, you can play with, it's really cool because you can play with those pinching parameters. So you can actually play with, I think, I never know exactly which direction, the X or the Y, the pinch X and pinch Y. Um, but you see, you can put pinching behavior. There's a lot you can do with very few materials. And Professor Filippo developed this material is as robust as it gets. I'm a big fan. I, if I could do concrete with hysteretic, I would. So try that. The, it may be good enough for what you're trying to do. I'm not going to take away from those materials. They're awesome, but they just have way more parameters that my brain can handle. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sylvia. Uh, just a quick question. Yes. Uh, actually, there's a lot of debate about the uh, force-based and displacement-based beam columns, you know. <laughs> so uh, what do you think is the best and what do you prefer, I mean, for your analysis? Okay, so you know my answer, right? It depends. Okay, so here's my little spiel. This is my little million dollar course on this. Here's my five cents. A displacement based element is going to give you the best answer if you have a single column so that you can put in a hundred elements and you're trying to capture the propagation of plasticity along your element, okay? You're doing a single test, a simple test. You've got that one column and it really does a great propagation, right? Because you're literally doing an, an, a, a great approximation of it. So if you're doing something like that, that's where I would recommend you use the displacement beam column element. So Pavan has got one big tall column and he's really trying to capture this you know, progression of plasticity. That gets expensive. It gets really expensive in a tall building or in a building or in a frame. The force beam column element, uh, which is the inverse, it, you know, one is based on assumed force distributions. The other one is uh, displacement distributions and things like that. The force-based beam column element is the most efficient and effective element type because you only need one element for that column. When Pavan needs 127 elements, I only need one. But be careful, don't use too many integration points because then you're putting in too many. And I think Michael Scott wrote a, a blog about this actually. Uh, force-based beam column element with three integration points is going to get you very far for a long time. The force beam column element in the old days, you had only one cross section across the entire element. So that was a problem. Well, that's out the window. Now you can assign a cross section at every integration point. And the beam with hinges is kind of what triggered that where you had inelastic distributed plasticity at the ends and the hinges and then elastic section in the middle. Well, what Michael Scott, and so that was his first iteration of that, which was great. And then he did an improvement on that. And I call that the distributed hinge element because it's not a whole distributed plasticity. But then he went in and he changed the force beam column element to do that and more. And it's got like a million different formulations and ways of integrations and you can control it. You can do, so what I, I figured out a way of doing a lump plasticity element using the force beam column element just by playing with plastic hinge lengths and weights. Um, so to me, it's the most versatile, but you got to be careful with softening. Michael's latest blog about, uh, you know, softening or things like that. It's an issue. You but have a lot of issues with that, right? Convergence issues too with the first element. It's not the element itself that has the convergence issues. It's actually very robust unless you've got the, what is that localization? So it's not super accurate if you're trying to get your plastic hinge strains or your strains in your fibers. Then it depends on, you got to look at the work that people have done on localization and things. But to me, it's like, wait a minute, we're looking at overall response. You can't, you can't win both ways. But if you look at the documentation for nonlinear, so it's a force-based beam column open seas wiki okay and you go here then you go to the very bottom of it it's just like this tiny little secret place um i showed this to uh, christian the other day so you see how it says integration types you click on that and then you're not even there yet you got to click on this pdf file and michael said he's going to write an update to this so this is the real documentation for the force beam column element that has a bunch of different integration schemes. Um, so the issue with the convergence with the beam column element is, I think it's more about your sections 
Um, and yeah, it's not going to be as quote unquote robust as your 127, L, you know, displacement based elements. But if you're doing a building, you can't quite do that. Someday we will when we have enough computational abilities and things like that. Um, but what I would do is I would, I would recommend doing the uh, distributed plasticity element, but understanding what the different integrations are and seeing what you're doing, or just go with the beam with hinges because he's done all the defaults for you. Um, and it's, it's a really nice element. And the beam with hinges is the one that solves that problem of instability uh, as an element. So, but there's a whole school about all these different types of integrations. So that's my high level non-computational person description of it. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, where are you calling from? Uh, yeah, I'm from Auckland too. <laughs> yeah, oh. I'm Auckland, but yeah, I'm just in a different place. That's all. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I've learned a lot from you. I appreciated all the feedback. And I, I really like Mohammed's idea of, uh, I, and, and I need to get more people to, uh, to help. And, and I'm happy to have that. So I'm going to give you a call, Mojave, and you're going to do my marketing, okay? Okay. <laughs> thank you very much for your time and knowledge. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, and thank you, thank Pavan, you. for organizing this. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much.